it's the DNA of the growth CMO, and I'd like to welcome the panelists. We're going to have a discussion about this. So panelists, come on in, and I'll tell you who's with us. Majur Agarwal, SAP. Lisa Armstrong, Pentair. Matthew Quint, Columbia University. So welcome, guys. Thanks so much. So we have an here. interesting topic today, and it's really about all the change going on, but really practically, what should we do about it? We all know about the change, but what practical, concrete, specific actions can we take? So what I'd like to do is start by saying, why should you guys care? What's important about the growth CMO and understanding its DNA? The first thing is, I think we need to thank all the people who are still here <laughs> because they <laughs> passed the first test. Yeah. <laughs> the diehards. The, the first trade of uh, being anything growth or anything is perseverance, and these people have stayed there <laughs> for two days. <laughs> so that is amazing. The, uh, but now, now to the uh, question. Uh, the topic of growth is, I think, on everyone's mind. The question is, why should we care as CMOs? That's a CEO topic agenda. What I uh, like to uh, take back before we dive into the details is if we look at S&P 500 and we look at this seven year rate of change in S&P 500, over the last 50 years, the rate of change has gone from 1.5% to 7%. What that means is that 1% means five companies are dropping out of S&P every year. So in about 100 years, there will be complete turnover of S&P 500, assuming there's no overlap. 1.5% means 65 years. So S&P would completely turn over in 65 years. At 7%, that's 14 years. So what is happening is when in the 30s and the 40s and 50s, we were building companies for the long haul, aka 65 years, now we are building and boards and CEOs are building companies for the 10 to 15 year duration. And that is the basic thing that's on everyone's mind. So if we feel the pay race pace is increasing, it's because of this. Companies that existed in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s will not exist 15 years from now. Even, you know, look at Google, look at Facebook, and I say even go back, look at Home Depot. Home Depot was a company that was started in 1978. Did not exist before that. That's just 35 years ago. So, Jur, that's great. Tell us then, how do you decode how this applies to a CMO and translate it into what should we do? Yeah. So, in, in the world of business, I was in Aspen uh, yesterday, and one of the professors from Yale said, there are three things you can do to uh, tackle this. Number one, you can create, which none of us can do. That's God's job. <laughs> you can discover, which is what, if you have a 60 or 65 year time horizon scientists and engineers can do. Or the third thing is you can be creative. And what is creativity? Creativity is taking two dissimilar concepts uh, or unseemly unconnected concepts and bringing them together. And he says there's no better profession than marketing to bring that together. And that is why the onus of growth is so much today on marketers as opposed to any other person in the C-suite. So it's really an opportunity. It is a great opportunity. It's the biggest opportunity I think that marketers have in the, n in the next 50 years. That's great. Let me ask you, Lisa. So we're talking about growth. What then is a growth CMO? Can you talk a little bit about what that is? Absolutely. I think, you know, Majur talked about it um, in terms of the, the statistics. And I'm saying I'm living it every day. So um, I'm a company called Pentair. About a year and a half ago, we we're 3 billion. Overnight, we doubled to 8 billion. And with that became a really an agenda of how do we grow. Um, and our, you know, our shareholders, the board, they're all asking for how can you grow not through acquisition, but how can you grow organically? And so that's what preoccupies my CEO. And therefore, because it preoccupies my CEO, it preoccupies me in terms of what I focus my energy on. And for me, that really, when we talk about the revenue, um, for me, it's about how do you change that conversation? So yesterday, you know, some of the things we talked about with you know, being on a board or, or, or addressing the C-suite, it's how do you have that conversation for, um, with your CEO. And so a lot of what I do is try and connect the dots between what I'm doing in terms of program, a big idea, back to revenue. Um, at the end of the day, it's really around either how we deliver something new to the market, 
how we do more of uh, what we are already currently selling to more customers or how we go into an adjacency. And everything I do, I try back and connect the dots uh, on that. Thank you. So recently, a study was done, partnership between SAP, CMO Club, and Human 1.0. And the study was talking to many CMOs to really define in a concrete manner what's the DNA that turns a CMO into a growth CMO. Majur, can you comment around what the study found, and then we're going to dive deep in a couple areas? Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I wouldn't even say it's a partnership between the SAP, CMO Club, and Human 1.0. It was a very selfish plot on my part, having living yeah. through all of this, to say, how do we collectively harness the, uh, the wisdom of the 800 CMOs that we have in the, in the group? And what we found was that there are 13 traits that CMOs care about. And I know you were going to flash up a slide and show all those 13. Uh, it's available on the digital uh, CMO Digital Clubhouse. But there are four that stood out uh, in terms of people who are driving outcomes. So there's culture, their capabilities, and their outcomes. And we found in terms of culture, data-driven culture and market centricity are the two that growth CMOs care disproportionately about. And in terms of capabilities, omni-channel, and that's a term that we've now heard quite a few times uh, over the last two days. I'm looking at Nadine right here. <laughs> that was just a topic uh, that was fresh and new I, I, in, in the last summit, that was like when Nadine did the panel, we weren't talking about omnichannel, but that's, that's where omnichannel commerce more appropriately is where the world is going and having new world talent. Talent is such a big, big thing, whether that's millennials, whether that is storytellers, whether that is GMs uh, overall. Th those are the four that we found were disproportionately. Uh, Thanks, so important. I'm gonna repeat the four just because I don't know where they are on the slide so everybody's clear because we're gonna talk about each of them briefly. <laughs> developing new talent, promoting a data-driven culture, advancing omnichannel capabilities, and creating market centricity. So I'd like to start with developing new talent, and of course, Matthew, Columbia University. <laughs> right, get the educator to talk about new talent. <laughs> Makes yeah. sense a little bit. Can you give a very brief definition, developing new talent, what does it mean, and perhaps give a brief example of that in, in action? Sure. I mean. I think most of you, uh, you know, the way we think about talent is, I'd say there's three key things, right? One is skill sets, and that's skill sets in both, uh, you know, hiring decisions as well as training your existing staff to grow their skill sets uh, as needed for the competencies that you have for their roles. There's, you know, what we'll call engagement of your employees, which is to let those, the talent and the skills that they have be something that they want to achieve within the organization that they're working for. So they have to feel like there's something in it for them within the organization. And that's certainly, as we're talking millennials, an even larger trend among something that millennials are expressing as an expectation they have for a work role. And of course, there's you know retaining talent. So once you've built it up, what are you doing organizationally to retain it? Um, and I mean, it's a, you know, some organizations, maybe you guys work for them, are building quote unquote universities, you know, brand, blank brand university. Uh, Deloitte does one. We've actually done work with uh, Pernod Ricard, uh, who has a Pernod Ricard university. Often that's done both by internal staff or in partnership, where one of the organizations that they've worked with to develop training. Uh, bring staff together, a lot of those things are bringing diverse staff, if you're a global organization, bringing folks together to learn from each other in different markets uh, is a key thing. Uh, and then of course, in general, I mean, education is going through this too. We realize there's a changing talent, changing workforce needs. You know, at Columbia Business School, uh, as part of the MBA program, that's been the traditional thing, two-year MBA program, the format for decades and decades, and just a few years ago, given one of the other topics we're going to talk about, data-driven culture. You know, at Columbia Business School, we built a, a shorter form, 18-month marketing and si uh, master's in science in marketing program to really get at candidates who didn't necessarily want that full MBA level, uh, you know, all the accounting, finance, et cetera, really wanted to dive into marketing and really wanted to dive into marketing in the numbers. They were, you know, loved stats, loved crunching numbers. And again, so built that up based on a need in both talent and a need for the workforce in this growing uh, area of understanding how to get, you know, how to get insightful things out of the data that we're all collecting now. 
So the key is diverse teams and learning how to grow them and build them and embrace them. That's right. Okay, second one, Lisa. So you talked about the C-suite and we're talking about omnichannel capabilities. How do you sell the idea of omnichannel capabilities to the C-suite? Absolutely. Well, one of the, you know, going back to the conversation, I was talking about how do you change the conversation. Um, I think when we initially went out and I was looking for big budgets to do digital, it was about productivity and you know efficiency. Okay, you know, I have a sales force, I wanted to do a whole um, iPad implementation, give them all iPads to go out and sell. And it was really around, okay, by doing this, you can do productivity, you're gonna reduce budgets around collateral and things like that. Um, and now what we've, we've done is starting to change the conversation. So still, we're still doing the same idea. We're still going out and, and equipping our sales force, let's say, for example, with iPads. But we're talking about how that's really a growth in an initiative. It's really around how do we enable them to go out and actually close the loop on a sale. So you know, traditionally they'd go out, they'd have a, you know, a sales opportunity, they sit across from somebody, they would you know, talk about something. Um, they wouldn't have all the different things that they wanted to talk about or to give that customer or leave with them. They go back to their office, maybe a week later they remember and they send something. In that meantime, that customer has probably went and researched something else or, you know, and, and they lost an opportunity. So we talk about how we can actually use these different um, tools in our digital toolkit and the investments we're making are really around how we're trying to um, grow the company. And so that's just same stuff, but just a different conversation um, on how we do that. Right, well, and it, it's a complex topic to implement, so I think those conversations and setting the stage is pretty important. Yeah, but I, I don't think, Lisa, necessarily it's the same thing, correct? We shift from uh, productivity to you know revenue and growth and incrementality. That's a fundamental shift in the conversation, a, at least from what I understand you, you saying. It's so it's, it's not the same conversation. That's a very different mindset that you need to have. Absolutely, and I think as in our level, in, in our roles, I think that's the conversation we're having. I don't know about you guys, but how many of you guys spend more time talking with your CFO, legal, and um, your CEO is more than you talk about other marketers? How many people do spend more time with those people, you. right? And so when I'm talking to those people, that's the conversation I'm having because to be honest, they don't really care about the platforms and technologies or the implementation. They care about how it's gonna affect their world. So I agree, it's a, it is a change and I think for us, um, we're the translators, so I have to speak engineering, I gotta speak legal, I gotta speak ops, I gotta speak all these different languages. Yeah. yeah, and as we were talking before, this growth agenda is an opportunity because the results are in the language of the business, which is re required to have the organizational-wide conversations. Data-driven culture, Matthew. This is yeah. different than data-driven insights. Can you tell us a little bit about what does it mean to develop a data-driven culture? Yeah, and I, I mean, we've certainly had a lot of discussions, I think, over the course of the day and a half so far, uh, really on these lines. I mean, I think of it, we think of it in three ways. One is, right, insights often come from taking a piece of data. When you're talking a, a specific piece of data for a specific need, you know, we had the great discussion just before lunch, the panel session, talking about the new tools and all that kind of thing, which is looking at data throughout the organization, trying to gather that data together, find ways for the data that various parts of your organization to collect collect and use it together. So really it's through a throughout the organization thing rather than looking at in I have my piece of siloed data and I'm gonna use it for a particular insight. And to also think constantly about turning to the data. Uh, the other thing that I know all of you guys are working on is KPIs, metrics. I mean, the data isn't just about getting sort of data-driven insights of what you market, but then as we've talked about and trying to get ROI numbers and those kind of things, looking at what you've put out as a marketer, what communications and messaging you've done, and what is the effectiveness of that. So coming up with, you know, valuable KPIs and metrics. And then the key thing which has come up also is, you know, agility, the ability to experiment, use the data, to understand things and then grow and uh, make final decisions based on early experimentation, which is the real value data has. Um, and a couple of you know areas we wouldn't think of being necessarily data culture, uh, written about a lot. Uh, we've had some of the folks who were involved in the Obama campaign uh, speak at our event about uh, some of the data-driven elements that they've used. And you get really, when you put it all together, you make that, your goal and you really see it through, you get insights that you wouldn't expect or you deliver on things that you never expect. So some of you may have read a, a couple of years ago, 
we're debriefing on sort of what the most effective email messages for fundraising were for you know President Obama in his uh, campaign uh, in this 2012 campaign uh, to be reelected. And some of those things, so it was a test and control, do something in the morning, what's getting the most results? This company called Optimizely was behind it. And then blasting out to the larger community based on what they thought the best results would be from a morning test. Sometimes that was based on real-time information. So on a day that Mitt Romney had, you know, the Republicans had had a great fundraising day, on June 26th, I think it was, the best thing was, hey, we're about to be outspent. That day, it was a real-time data. But over the course of the campaign, if you're a marketer, you'd probably never expect this, but by doing this kind of a data culture, the most successful headline to get fundraising for Obama was, hey, which is not what a marketer's instinct might be, and they never would have gone that way, but that kind of a cultural thing um, is a great example of how you can really live that and benefit your company when you take it seriously. That's an awesome example, thank you. Madur, the final dimension. So can you tell us a little bit about creating market centricity, what it means, and maybe an example? Yeah, um, the notion of, of market centricity is uh, starting, it, it, it's very simple at a basic level, it's outside in instead of inside out. I know we talk a lot about, lo lot about that, uh, but we find that uh, ourselves within the company, I work for SAP, we've got 3,000 products, uh, 36,000 SKUs, and we love to talk the, the conversation of every product, and, and, and so turning uh, on its head the conversation from talking in terms of the audiences and the customers we're dealing with is, is, a, is a hard, hard uh, topic. Uh, and we like to say, be the voice of the market. The notion of marketing, the word market is in marketing. Don't be, don't be the blowhorn of voice of XYZ company you are in. You start with outside in. Uh, I'll give an example. I travel a lot, as some people know here, live on United. And uh, about two months ago on United, there was an ad which was talking about their social media capabilities. And the person who leads their social media effort said, I like to think myself as the voice of the 85,000 employees that work at United. And I went, huh, I wish you had thought about yourself as the voice of the two and a half million customers <laughs> who travel every, <laughs> every day, right? That would be so much more effective in that. And that, that to me is the notion of uh, market centricity. Yeah, and it's one of those dimensions that really has never changed, right? It's the one unchangeable, customer first and then build from there. So we are short on time. I'm going to ask each of you to give in less than 10 words the key takeaway you would provide to our audience built around what should we do as CMOs? What do you want folks to leave with in 10 words or less? Matthew? Uh, so I'd say if you look at, let's say, these four things or any of the 13, start now. Okay. You're not doing something here. Start now. Experience is what gets you to the level where you'll be satisfied with what you're doing. Lisa? Um, I'd say connect the dots. Um, ensure that everything you're doing, you're connecting it back to um, top line. Major. I, I would say uh, go to the board, ask for a number. Mary Meeker said, so more low, social, mobile, local, add a co-commerce to it, digital plus commerce, digital commerce, that's your chance. Go and own a number. Awesome. So I want to say one more thing, and that is this study we're talking about and an explanation of it will be a feature piece on the CMO Solutions Clubhouse under leveraging a ch culture of change as growth CMO. So I encourage you to take a look at it. There's going to be a bunch of content built around that if you want to do a deeper dive. And would you please give it up for the panel? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.